Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beyond 2020, the Executive Mindset. My name is Kelly Collins. I'm here with Nutanix. We are very happy to have you all with us today. Um, I'll be helping moderate the session. Just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, you'll notice that we have you guys all on mute upon joining. We do ask that you keep it that way. Um, the background noise can get a little distracting, as you know, but not to fear. If you have any questions, utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. I know you're all familiar with that. Um, we'll be moderating that throughout the session. So if there's any questions that um, pertain to the conversation as it flows, we'll be asking them throughout. But we also have dedicated time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask anything that you're interested in. I'm going to send it over to Lauren McEwen and Zach Granada, who are channel sales managers with Nutanix as well. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, everyone, so much for joining. My name is Zach. Um, I work with CDW, just like Lauren. And I'm so excited for this event today. Uh, 12 months ago when we were all just getting used to the new normal and uh, we, we very quickly got very tired of it, especially the phrase new normal. And um, then I ran into Jamie Metzel on, I wish on the side of the street in New York, but instead it was a podcast and then, you know, followed by a set of videos. And I just, you know, I, I couldn't imagine a better opportunity to talk about how all of our technology and human nature is interconnected and how that's going to be a predictor for the future. So we, uh, we called up a couple of friends and got a pretty great rock star group to discuss it and um, let's see where it goes. I'm really excited. But with that, I'll kick it off by just letting it go to Lauren and add a few more remarks. Absolutely, thanks Zach. So um, I'm Lauren McEwen. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining today. Um, as Zach mentioned, we absolutely have a rock star panel um, joining us today. Uh, Jamie Metzl, D Zach touched on, um, you know, why why we've asked him to be here today. Um, Wendy Pfeiffer, who is the CIO of Nutanix. Um, if you haven't had the pleasure of hearing her or following her on Twitter, um, today is your lucky day. So um, Wendy has spent a lot of time helping out with the CDW partnership over the last four years since I've been working here. And um, so she was an easy one to, that came to mind to ask to be part of this discussion. Um, CDW being our largest global partner, of course, asking Phil Taylor to be here as well and share his insights and perspective um you know was was is a is a great going to be a great contributor today as well and then simon taylor who's with haiku um ceo of haiku actually um their purpose built back up for nutanix so again just like a really um, natural group of folks that we felt would be um really easily tied together and um and jackie Okowitz is going to help us do that today by moderating the panel jackie Okowitz, um she is a, a manager at cdw who um, leads a group of solution architects in the data center um, area data center practice at cdw um, we work with those guys on a daily basis and um, so jackie thank you for also joining to um, to moderate the panel today love the button and um, thanks again for you guys coming to spend some time with us we're going to record the session today and we'll, we'll share it out so if you enjoy what you hear today feel free to share it with some other people in your network who weren't able to make it jackie over to you thanks lauren and i don't know if everybody caught the collective uh we're going to record so um if you didn't get insight into a couple of our uh our practice runs where, where we talked through some of the content um hopefully you'll get that same vibe through the recording but thank you laura thank you zach for the invitation thanks to um our friends and partners with nutanix for um joining forces with us to bring this crew together i am going to be your ringmaster for the session as lauren said i am a cdw coworker. i've been a part of the organization now for almost 19 years um, i have the tremendous honor of leading a team of architects that work alongside our customers to help them navigate all of this change um, and change that's happening at an exponential rate, which we're going to really dig into here today. So um, thank you for the invitation. I look forward to being today's ringmaster. Um, up first, I'm going to go ahead and ask our uh, celebrity talent, which I know Jamie loves being referred to, but I'm going to have Jamie kick it over to you for a little bit of background and bio on you. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jackie and, and everybody. Uh, really thrilled to be here. I'm Jamie Metzl. I'm a technology futurist. Uh, author of the book, Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. 
um, a, a member of the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing, and I spend a lot of my life's energy trying to understand where the world is heading, but more importantly, what are all of our responsibilities to make sure that we play our role in making that a, a comfortable transition that's guided by our most cherished values and not by the technology itself. Brilliant, Jamie, thank you. Wendy, I'm gonna kick it over to you next to go ahead and give a little background and bio on, on you. Absolutely, so I'm Wendy Pfeiffer. I am Nutanix's CIO. Uh, I also sit on a handful of boards, um, Qualys and SADA systems, and more interestingly, uh, just joined the board of the American Gaming Association. Uh, I am a mom married to a musician and my daughter just published her first novel at age 13 with a real publisher. So back to you. That's great, Wendy, thank you. Um, next, Simon, if you could go ahead and uh, do a brief intro on you, that'd be great. Sure, I'm Simon Taylor. I'm the CEO of Haiku, that's H-Y-C-U. We are a multi-cloud backup as a service provider uh, that actually built the world's first purpose-built data protection product for Nutanix. Uh, I've had the thrill of working with Wendy Pfeiffer for the last few years and Lauren and many others, uh, and I'm just happy Absolutely thrilled to be here. A big fan of Jamie's and excited for the uh, entire program. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate that. Uh, last but not least, one of the newest cohorts to the CDW family, Mr. Phil Taylor. Uh, you can go ahead and round us out for intros. That'd be awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Phil Taylor, CTO at IGNW, and really uh, got my start at like 13 years old programming computers and, and building them and ripping them apart. And then you know, my parents urged me to go to college, so I went to college and got a degree. And then ultimately, I've been a tech entrepreneur my whole life, if I look back, but didn't didn't get my start until a little bit later. Um, worked in financial and healthcare verticals, writing software for about you know ten years, and then started my own companies. One of which was a serverless cloud computing company, Brightwork, that you saw on the slide. Went through TechStar Chicago as venture backed, but really a software engineer and, and and a tech entrepreneur at heart. And most recently, we took a lot of those concepts into what we now call digital velocity solutions as part of CDW, which is really helping customers take technologies like Nutanix and rethink the way that they build and deploy software applications and think about infrastructure within their environments. So really about uh, creating agility and velocity within organizations. So we're excited to be here today. Happy to be part of the panel. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. Um, Jamie, so I give you a little bit of heads up. This is uh, going to come to you, you first, but I, I welcome feedback from the rest of the pan panelists. But um, Jamie, specifically, you've written that a super convergence of multiple technologies is going to drive exponential change, right? I, I think we're all very much feeling that and have been um, certainly in, in the recent few months. The irony that you're on a call right now, sponsored by a company who calls the foundation of their business hyperconverged, is just too much to overlook. So yep. I'm going to need you to unpack some of that for us and give us uh, a little bit of your, your background and detail there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jack. And that's why I'm excited to be here with all of you to, to share my perspectives, but also to, also to learn. Um, because we're in this moment of just incredible change. And I think understanding what are the forces of that change at least makes us better able to manage it because it just when we think from an evolutionary perspective how are our, how did our brains evolve they evolved to solve some really practical problems in the savannas of africa if you were an exponential thinker as our ancestors and you were imagining flying machines you were the first guy who was going to get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger our ancestors had to think very very practically to survive and so now there's a mismatch between just the, the thing our brains evolved to do and the world that we're experiencing around us. And yes, I think we all get that it's not any one technology, but it's a, a super convergence of technologies. But there's something even deeper uh, that's, uh, that's happening here. A hundred years ago, um, there were about 2 billion people on planet Earth and 20% of them were literate. That means about 400 million people were able to share their ideas with each other, but even that sharing was really slow and clunky. And so it took a long, long time. Now there's 7 billion people, 85% uh, literacy. So that's 5.5 billion people are uh, contributing to shareable human knowledge. 
Not only that, we are networked with each other. Our ancestors developed copper and bronze at different rates in different parts of the world. Sometimes there were thousands of years separating people figuring out copper and bronze in one civilization or geography versus another. But, and so just imagine if that, if you're measuring human progress based on that, the people who figured it out a thousand years or 2000 years later than somebody else, they kind of lost 2000 years of doing cool stuff with copper and bronze. Right now we have these 5.5 billion literate people. Uh, we're all networked. So the second you figure out something, somebody else on earth doesn't have to figure that out that becomes that person's starting point. So these 5.5 billion people every day are solving new problems. And that's a really, really important piece of this. And then we have not just each individual, as I was mentioning before, each individual technological revolution, but each one enables and inspires the others. I do a lot of work in the genetics and, and biotech worlds. You couldn't possibly understand the complexity of, of genetics or systems biology without computer science and machine learning and AI. So you, you can't even separate those out. But once you use, once we use those incredible tools to understand biology, then it, everything goes full circle because now there's the whole movement of biodesign where biology is still way more complicated than our ability to understand it. We're harnessing it. We're developing new models for even things like computer chips for solving problems. And so this key point is just it's this acceleration because everything that we do creates additional opportunities. Everything is in this circle of accelerating change. And we throw around the term exponential change a lot. But basically what it means is if you um, if you try to measure and predict the rate of change, based on your historical experience of it, by looking in the rear view mirror, you're going to be way too conservative because the rate of change is accelerating. And that's it comes back to where I started with the, what our brains are, function, are designed to do is to think linearly. And so everybody has to just feel a little bit, and I also write science fiction, but everybody has to be a little bit of a futurist, a little bit of a science fiction writer. Like our ancestors, you don't want to have you, I shouldn't say your head in the clouds when, when we're talking about cloud computing, your head in the cloud. Um, but we, you really need to balance um, kind of understanding where we are now with a deep appreciation of the accelerating rate of change and what that means. Thank you for that, Jamie. And I, I as you say that, and I think through, you know, recent months and just as as a mom and as a you know a coworker at CDW, you know, I think about periods of time where my brain wanted to be very stale and just not process all the things, but then also thinking about how much we truly have to consider and and to your point of getting in that futuristic futurist mindset, I've I've felt that all of that immensely. But I'm going to move over to Wendy because I I can see the excitement in her eyes as you talk about some of these topics. And I know um, as a techie, she's thought a lot about this notion of enterprise and consumer, you know, convergence. Um, and obviously she she conveyed before she's a, she's a big fan of your work. So Wendy, I wanted to get some feedback and commentary from you on, on some of the stuff Jamie shared, but this notion of this super convergence driving all of this exponential change. Well, Jamie, that was a super cool cloud joke, dad joke, um, you know, respect man for, for trying, um, that was good. Um, look, I, I, I have been working in this primordial soup of technologies that are delivered to enterprises that we use to enable the business of the world. And we have just been ripe for something to happen. Um, and, and I think this pandemic has, has driven um, a, a certain change, a, a certain catalyzing. The biggest change I've experienced is um, the acceleration of this hybrid cloud mode that we're working in. The fact that we're having to consume all the resources in the ecosystem, whether they're public cloud, whether they're on premises from multiple vendors, but also something has happened um, because we're working in our home environments 
consumer technology and enterprise technology have merged. I'm speaking to you over my gaming computer, over public internet. These are things that would never have happened in, in you know, an enterprise environment, but also enterprise technology doesn't necessarily show up very effectively in the cool consumer tech environment. Um, consumer tech is purpose built for human beings and, and um, the interaction designs are completely different. And so we're now excelling accelerating bringing those technologies via hybrid cloud, via this hyper-converged infrastructure, right? It's just this, this mixing with maybe a couple of, you know, bolts of lightning um, into the primordial soup of all this tech we've got. Um, interestingly enough, we have another vector coming into the mix, which is Gen Z. And that's a digital native generation. And, and so they think differently. They actually work in multi-threaded ways, right? They, they, they can have a Discord session and a gaming session. And you know the way my kids are uh, convincing me also be studying at the same time in, in online school in ways that, that um, my brain uh, just can't process information. And so it's an extremely exciting time. We need these enabling technologies but we also need enabling frameworks in terms of how we think about these things. And, you know, 2023, that's uh, the year that Genesis code, uh, you know, starts, right? So we're, we're like almost there. Um, I'm just so curious, like how, how, how it's going to play out. Um, but it, it looks like we're, we're right on the cusp of some of the things that you were, that you were writing about 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I, it's 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 interesting to put all the pieces together, Wendy, and sort of see these things that, you know, you think back and I, we might have discussed this, you think about the Jetsons and how just out of this world that felt and how just all of the things that we've been planning for and customers are talking about their needs, they're coming to fruition. And um, Simon, I'd love to get some of your thoughts and feedback as it relates to um, you know, this exponential change and converging of really all the things and everyone being home and managing that and thoughts on, on how we, we take that all in and we more importantly move forward and, and we plan. Yeah, no, I mean, a couple of things first, you know, Jamie, when Jamie was talking about, you know, how much things have changed and how, you know, we, these paradigm shifts throughout history, I was just suddenly reminded of my, uh, my brother-in-law and my sister married her husband he was a theoretical physicist and a mathematician. And my very conservative father looks across the dinner table and says, how are you gonna make money, son? You know, and, and today he is the head of artificial intelligence at DARPA. <laughs> and so it's just so amazing how even, you know, 10, 15 years ago, these concepts of theoretical math and theoretical physics were so kind of um, out there and really science fiction. And now we're just seeing it all come to fruition. So. Talk about a convergence right by my own dinner table. I think that was really interesting. The other thing, though, is, is when I hear Wendy talk, I am reminded so clearly why Haiku decided to invest so heavily in Nutanix. You know, when we started out building backup and recovery as a service, you know, we noticed that the market was really kind of uh, condensing and consolidating it once again. And I think, I think we started to see that Nutanix was becoming almost like the connective tissue you know, in between the multi-cloud, you know, sort of world and the hybrid world. And, you know, I think that is a, a very clear paradigm shift. For years and years, people have just been building point solutions. People are trying to build technology that focuses on fixing a very specific need. And ultimately, the way to get the big bucks was to try to build their own platform that did everything. And I think what we're seeing today is that the, with these hyperscalers, these massive clouds, there's only really three that are dominating the entire marketplace. But the folks who are able to really leverage the, uh, the multi-cloud experience effectively are the ones that are providing that connective tissue between them, allowing you to avoid vendor lock-in, allowing you to sort of jump from cloud to cloud, allowing you to have greater visibility. So again, I think that the, the future of technology today is really about trying to recreate that connective tissue in more meaningful ways as we move forward. And I think if we can do that, uh, we can be really successful in helping our customers and our partners, you know, to grow and, and uh, really um, thrive in this sort of new digital economy. 
Yeah, I, you know, I, it's interesting as you say that it's kind of like a perfect segue um, for Phil to talk about some of the work and, you know, his areas of responsibility and focus in terms of how we deliver more of that value and that connective tissue for customers. But Phil, I'm curious about some of your feedback. Yeah, so build once, run everywhere, right, as Simon was pointing into. And then I think, you know, out of Wendy's um, analogies, like there used to be two different places that you experience technology as a consumer at home different end user experience, right? Whether you're on the Atari gaming system or some crazy first generation uh, mobile device, right? That we all went through. And then I think when Apple released the iPhone, it, it tipped over for people, right? They said, why does work have to be so difficult? Why are these enterprise applications not human interfaces? Why is it so hard to work with these things? And so, you know, what we have is a bunch of technical debt out in, in the market and people are carrying that along, but we're starting to see that it's not okay to do that anymore. You know, um, as Jamie pointed out, you know, the rate of change is accelerating. Technology has gotten extremely complex, but it's actually the easiest time in ev ever in history to launch a new startup, to disrupt an industry, to change the world, right? Within a very, very short amount of time. In the past, there were industries that were protected, you know, and I'll draw on one that everybody knows, Uber and taxis, right? You would have thought that was a protected industry. Within a very short period of time, I think less than six years, they disrupted the whole industry, right? And if you as a business operator are not thinking about these things, not thinking about software and technology as the core to everything you do, whether it's uh, delivering, you know, outcomes in, the, in, a, in a clinical environment at a, at a surgery center because you, you know, own um, surgery clinics and you're a doctor, you know, your technology is really what's enabling you to do that today, as well as, you know, uh, industries where they were not as agile when, the, when this pandemic hit last year and they struggled to go remote first. You know, I think these newer generation companies are remote first, their, their new workforce is remote first. And so it, now is the time to change, right? Now is the time that you need to adopt technologies like Nutanix, you know, that allow you to get that portability. Do I think the data center is completely gone or going away? No, I think it's, it's a hybrid or multi-cloud experience. And there are very specific industries where that will always be the case, right? Manufacturing, retail, even in hospitality, right? Cruise ships are always gonna need some level of compute. The idea that, that 5G is gonna deliver everything is great, but it'll take a very long time for that uh, technology to mature and be available. And so we've done amazing things like that, you know, take hyper-converged technology, drop it on ships, fleets of ships. And, um, you know, while another partner is writing a brand new user experience, right? So that the consumer can order things right off their phone and have somebody show up with it right at their table side, right? Without having to interact. Um, or wait for a server to come around, but somebody has got to actually run that infrastructure, right? And it has to stay consistent because if you don't do that, then I take a cruise one year and it's a different experience than my friend took a cruise and, and the, the actual brand suffers, right? Which is kind of what was happening when you see you know, the rate of it, a change happening um, and, and the competitors that are able to keep up, they end up surviving while the other ones, you know, fall to the wayside and uh, go out of business eventually. So I think now's the time to invest in these technologies. Now is the time to think about automation to get scale. You know, how do you recreate the entire environment, you know, 50,000 times a day as Facebook does with their Android client, you know, shipping and testing it so that their end user gets a better experience every time they log into the system. And, you know, it's in a disruptive way or not, excuse me, a non-disruptive way, right? They're not seeing this brand new experience. And, I think that's what we struggle with in enterprise, right? Is we've got a huge facelift to give most of these experiences in enterprise. And once that's done, you know, think about Epic, for example, in the clinical setting, when it moves to the web, when you're able to actually start making changes on the server side that impact the user in a subtle way, you know, now they've achieved um, what somebody like Facebook or other more commercial applications are able to do every day. And I think that's where it's headed. You know, we're seeing it with Netflix. We've seen it with lots of major brands in the market. And we're now starting to see it. You know, this year, actually, I think did help tip that over. We're starting to see it in retail and manufacturing. They're investing big dollars into it. We thought projects would stall out, but actually they, they doubled down and invested while, while everybody's at home, they're taking advantage of renovating some of these technical bet solutions and, and rebuilding. So really interesting commentary, Phil, and a lot of, you know, the, the, the in-flight adoption. So of the things that, that folks are, and Phil, I'm going to stick with you first, but of the things that folks are adapting or implementing, today, what do we think is going to have the staying power? What do we think is going to stick with us? Or what's a function of this is how we have to respond based on the environment we're in? Where do we get that, that lift? Where do we go forward? What, what stays with us? Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's the experience, right? The idea that um, you're 
going to continue to hire a workforce that has to come into the office. I think it's gone away. That's that's key. So, you know, moving to solutions like O365 or G Suite is an absolute must for for consumers. Like continuing to manage your own mail service doesn't make sense anymore because the the technology is moving so fast that you would have to hire hundreds and thousands of people to keep up with that type of approach. And so really renovating that and changing it to an automated approach and leveraging as many, you know, PaaS services as you can that aren't in what you consider your core area of IP within your business, right? And I think that's probably the, the key there is, you know, can I buy a hyper-converged technology rather than have a bunch of people stitching together the solution and, and get some of that human capital back so that they can focus on things like automating the application layer, right? And not administering servers by hand. So I think those are investments that they'll never go away once once they've done that. And that's it's really what cr creates the acceleration, right? If I'm hand building the network, it's this huge labor intensive task. Well, if I'm slowly adding code every week and every day to build the network, then we want to make a big change. I can run a bunch of automated tests to ensure that the network's not broken and we can roll it out overnight. And, and nobody is the wiser that it even happened generally versus the old approach, which is we roll it out. We cross our fingers, we get everybody on deck waiting for the support calls to come in because we know we broke somebody's application, right? As soon as we made that change, we knew it was gonna break somebody's application because we didn't, we didn't have any way to test it. So I think those are the things that you can invest in today that are they're gonna be relevant tomorrow, whether you know, you're automating against a cloud system or you're automating against an on-prem deployment. That's one of the areas that we help is that build once run anywhere, right? So if you have a platform like Nutanix that can extend into the cloud, you know, you have the you have the ability today. You have I like to say you have all the ingredients now in your pantry. Let's just go create the recipe together, right? To make this work well and kind of you know I don't even have to invent it because the public cloud has already shown us the patterns and practices that we need to put into place, and they work in the data center as well. I'm seeing a uh, a lot of head nodding out of Simon. I feel like there is uh, some commentaries that you're <laughs> you're ready to insert on this one. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I just I, I just want to shake. Phil's hand right now. I agree with him so much. Um, I, I think a couple of things, you know, interesting sort of paradigm shift in, in our marketplace that was very unexpected. I think everyone was talking about how COVID drove sort of massive flight to the cloud. And that's true. I mean, I mean, absolutely. There were an enormous number of customers that moved to the cloud, but 40% of our customers moved at least one workload back on-prem during COVID. And so, so it's this interesting paradigm where, where you sort of say, okay, it did drive massive digital transformation. It absolutely did. But I think it also showed people, uh, it taught them a lesson. You know, when you move very fast, when your data isn't protected, when you're not thinking about how to manage a multi-cloud environment, you know, that can be very, very challenging. Um, and and so, so I think understanding that, you know, very much like Dole said, if you, if you believe everything's going to cloud, I'm probably going to disagree with you. Um, I do think that, that we will continue to see that massive adoption and that will be important. But I think that people are going to start to understand the rules of the road, the rules of engagement. And it turns out that a lot of the rules that we learned on-prem in the last 20, 30 years actually apply in new forms You know, when we move to the public cloud. We still need to manage the data. We still need to protect the data. We still need to worry about things like simple things like password protection. You know, ransomware, ransomware attacks went off the charts, you know, in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and there's a reason for that. You know, all this digital transformation, all this disruption creates inroads for hackers to come and make those attacks. So talking about consolidation and convergence of technology, that's another one, right? I mean, I think ransomware is going to get implemented into almost everything that we see and do, and that's incredibly important. But just to up-level really quickly, you know, you know, in terms of what's really changing in the market, uh, sorry, Jackie, do you want me to, do you want to jump in? No. No, you're going right where I was going to add. We were going to talk about characteristics next because I think that's kind of, you know, we take us out of the, you know, the touch of the tech, you know, we take it up a level. Um, we talked a little bit about characteristics, but you go first and then we can, we can pivot back there. But I thought, I think this might've been where you were already taking us. Oh, sounds good. So no, no, I was just thinking about how actually when, when, when Jamie was talking earlier, it just, it spawned me this idea around, you know, what actually happened to people you know, throughout COVID and just really quickly, you know, the three things that, you know, I really noticed, you know, was massive shift in communication. We're all aware of that and doing it right now. Um, an increase in resilience. You know, I think, you know, our ability and our need to be more resilient as people is equally sort of applied to the technology sphere. So when we think about, you know, resilient infrastructure, we think about our ability to, you know, back up and protect data, our ability to be up and running all the time. 
it's very much the way that I think we all emotionally felt over the last year as we were trying to move through things. And then the last piece for me is just kind of generosity of spirit. You know, I think this was in sort of the, the tale of two cities, the darkest time and the best of times, because we all got to experience things in a different way, uh, appreciate each other a little bit more. And I think that was a really impactful kind of thing for a lot of people and their families in the last sort of year. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I feel all of that. And I know, Wendy, when we talked yesterday and, and we caught up on, on some of those characteristics and the things that are really going to kind of, you know, help people survive and usher them through this, um, you had some interesting takes on, on, on those and, you know, generationally, who's going to help propel us forward and how we adapt to that if you aren't a part of that generation. Yeah, um, look, going forward, um, we, we have experienced something as, as a global population that has changed us and it's changed some uh, elements of our population more than others. But going forward, um, we, we started out human centered now. Um, you know, we allow employees to say, this is how I want to work. I want to be hybrid this many days a week, or, you know, this is how I feel about uh, vaccination or, or, you know, this is what I've learned about uh, balancing work and, you know, seeing my family or whatever. Um, what we're forming, what we're doing is what human beings do. We're creating these ecosystems of collaboration, but the ecosystems of collaboration going forward are less about corporate structures, in my opinion, and even less about technical structures. You know, um, AWS is a standalone entity that I only consume. And instead they're around um, our choice, our personal choice. So perhaps I will have an ecosystem of collaboration around a time zone radius because I don't like waking up in the middle of the night anymore to work with team members in another time zone because that impacts my family. Um, or maybe I'll be more locally focused or maybe I'll create an ecosystem that includes uh, technology from multiple vendors or uh, consume multiple clouds. And so um, having the tooling and also the sort of the knowledge and experience that we can do that, that that's, that's a human endowment for us to be able to, um, to adapt our environment to, uh, to work the way we want it to, um, that's at the core of good design. That's at the core of uh, good technology architecture. And we need enabling technologies for that, but we also need enabling thinking for that. And that's where Gen Z comes in. Um, you know, I, I have been making myself um, use the technologies that, that my Gen Z kids use to do my day job. Like I, I think Discord, it may, may replace Slack for my company. I'm, I've brought in a POC. Um, it, it's, it's nicer. Um, it's more natural for me. It allows me to, uh, more autonomy. Um, and, and so I'm just starting to try to learn from them. Likewise, choice you know in it we're all about standards you know we're we're a mac shop or we're a pc shop or whatever you know um nutanix technology flies in the face of that right haiku technology flies in the face of that um but also consumer technology flies in the face of that you know what it, i've i've got Facebook on my on my phone. And I don't say, you know, okay, well, Facebook is my social networking standard. And so I could never use Twitter or Instagram or anything else because, you know, I've chosen. I mean, I, I can figure out when to use what and, and how to show up in each of those locations. And I think um, I, I have like a hint of how to do that. Um, Gen Z is identity neutral. Um, they really are, right? Identity is about um, achievement. It's, it's about um, helping. It's, it's about um, even imagination. And so um, they're going to show up in our workplace. There's, there's some statistics that say by in, in the next six years, um, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of our workers in tech will be Gen Z. Um, they don't have to show up to an office. They don't have to have a job title in order to be productive and in order to have, uh, you know, value structure. So I'm fascinated with that, a little scared because I'm trying to create those, those productive environments. Um, what I've learned is I need this, this common foundation, this common substrate against which I can do what Phil said and what, and what Simon said, which is write code once and reuse it many times, right? Um, you know, create the, the model and the framework. And then in my organization, 
um, we extend that model and framework by letting the machine refine the code, right? Um, you know, the, our robot overlords will be happy to hear me saying this, but right, the, the machine continuously is refining the code. 85% of all of our service operations in my organization today are detected and addressed autonomously. That's up from 0% four years ago. So talk about exponential change. Um, th that's, a, that's a dramatic, dramatic sea change in how people are interacting with technology. Uh, yeah, this, this notion of Gen Z and having a better understanding and everything that they're going to bring, it, it, it strikes like a healthy amount of anxiety in me, like things I know I can take on, but I certainly don't have innately because it's just not how I came to be in my current state. So it's an exciting evolution. Um, and I personally just hope I can keep up. Um, Jamie, there was a lot of nodding from, from your end on this, on this initial question here. Curious if there's some uh, characteristics or feedback um, that you think that, you know, folks are accelerating today that we'll hold on to that will kind of help usher them forward and yeah. not. Sure. Yeah. And so absolutely, I think that it's a really critical question because one of the things that I've been saying from the beginning of the pandemic is it's not that we have these new trends coming out of whole cloth. Um, but trends that were already happening are being super accelerated. The way I say it, it's the future is crashing into the into the present. So we always uh, we're, we're moving. We were already moving toward virtualization, and now it's just sped up. I mean, I remember in the earliest days of the pandemic, when you say, "Well, let's have a video call." Well, what's that? Now everybody on Earth is on. Not, not everybody on Earth, but a lot of people are on video calls and that we've enabled this remote possibility that just didn't exist before. And people were saying what's gonna happen gradually, it happened all at once. Um, the, the genetics and biotech revolutions, it's been many, many decades, even centuries in the making, um, but it's been super accelerated. And then connecting what at least Wendy and Simon were saying, it's, it's really interesting because on one hand, Wendy was talking about, well, how do we, how do we humanize these transformations so that they're empowering to people and it doesn't feel like tech is happening to them, but, it, but they are part of the process and, and part of the story. And that's really essential. And Simon was saying, well, companies and maybe even individuals are going to have to figure out what type part of their work happens on, on prem, which is a, it's a new shorthand for me, um, and what happens in the cloud but there's an even bigger issue that we're all facing is, well, what do humans do? What are the things that humans do better than machines? And how can we be all in on being great at those? Because whatever our aspirations, we live in a highly competitive environment. And especially for people in the business world, um, you, it's, it has to be profitable. It has to be more competitive than other competitors who are using different forms of organization. And so while we have to do these things, we have to be human centered. And I personally believe that that is the successful business bet. All of this is going to happen in a very, very competitive environment. We're competing within for resources within our own companies. We're competing with other companies in our space. And then our world is globalizing so rapidly that, that especially for a lot of the functions and services that, that we're discussing, um, regulation is really the only thing that's keeping it bound in any, uh, in any geography. And so that's what makes this moment so exciting. Um, but it's really, it's, it's, we're facing some pretty existential questions. And yes, they're the you know, big, if this was kind of a future of humanity conversation, we would say, well, what do robots do or what do, or what do humans do? Or, or how do we think about kind of the hardware and software that we're born with versus the hardware and software that we integrate? But it's a really practical business question for every business, one per Wendy, and how do we, how do, we do the right thing? But how do we do the right thing within a highly competitive environment where we also need to do the thing that will make our business successful? So I, I want to see if Phil has any commentary here, but what I'd like to additionally do is as you 
as Jimmy makes those comments, I think, okay, I get that. Who are the early players achieving this? Who's, who's excelling? Who's, and you just lost me. Oh, we can still hear you. You can still hear me. Okay, I lost everybody on video. But who, who organizationally, who's, who's out there kind of getting an early start or has sort of established this motion? So, Phil, I'll go to you first. I know I kind of yeah, just sure. grabbed a, um, a curveball out there. But as Jamie talked, I'm thinking someone's there or very much getting there. And, and who is it? Yeah, so I think both Wendy's and Jamie's points are super relevant around the way the behavior of the employee is changing, right, with the new generations and the way that, you know, we don't want to hire a workforce to do um, – the minutia, right? If the systems can do that work, we need to leverage them, right? As Jamie said, how, how do we amplify what the employees are good at, right? What the humans are good at. And so I think, you know, if you look at um, what's happening in I'll draw on most of my background is more technical, but Netflix, you know, really is the first company I saw doing this right. You know, they went through a number of gyrations as, as they built their business. The first one being they were a brick and mortar, basically, right? A DVD distribution network where you went, they had a website and that was it. And they sent you DVDs. So they had to solve a logistics challenge. But what they quickly realized was, well, broadband sitting every household, streaming is the next big thing. If we don't do it, somebody else will. And so Amazon comes on scene and, and launches video on demand. Netflix changed their psychology and their behavior on the way they were thinking about their business, the way they were doing things, started adopting things and actually became pioneers in what the industry now calls microservices, which is really the idea that we're breaking these services down. You know, to Wendy's point, we stop thinking about siloed standards like Microsoft versus Oracle shop. And we say, what's the best tools for this team, this group of humans to solve this problem the quickest and the most efficient way. And so when you do that, you, you're, taking a pattern that now applies to any technology, if you can create that runtime environment to make that successful, you, know, you can achieve higher outcomes. And so, you know, that leads us fast forward. We didn't really see AI and ML um, really getting adopted until probably the last four years, right? We saw people struggle with big data projects. We saw people struggle to implement AI and ML, except for in very, very unique use cases like R&D or biotech, right? Where they were using HPC clusters and it was very proprietary to the compute they were using. And, and, and now we're seeing those technologies actually become almost a commodity where myself having no background in data science, I can go leverage some GCP, AI, ML um, APIs and do natural language processing, right? Something that would have taken my team years to develop on their own. I can do it in minutes. And so I think that's, we're starting to see it in the, every cloud provider is, is following these patterns. Um, every major consumer team that's, that's relevant as a brand, Uber, Netflix, uh, Facebook, they're all following these patterns. And we're starting to see that proliferate. I think Wendy's team is following these patterns. If she's been able to build a team in four years that went from zero to 85% coverage on automatic resolution of problems, you have to be implementing these patterns. And that's kind of what I meant about the complexity is going up, but the technology is helping us actually keep up with that curve, right? That, that um, rate of change that Jamie was talking about. So I'd say those are some of the ones we're seeing. You know, Apple, obviously, a lot of the big names. Amazon would be key, right? So my family survived because of Amazon. We didn't leave the house for four months straight because we had some high risk individuals, but yet packages could be dropped off every other day, right? Within 48 hours, we could have the things we needed. And that's only possible because they've adapted and changed the way that they think about distributing e-commerce from, you know, back in the early days, as I was mentioning, Netflix being a very simple distribution model to now, holy, holy moly, they've, they've solved the last mile, right? There's, there's some cities that can get these packages in four hours, right? If you're in a major metropolitan area, I live an hour outside the city and I'm still able to get them in, in 48 hours or 24 hours in some cases, you know, that's huge innovation for the consumer. And so um, those would be some of the brands that I would think are, are tracking and actually some of the books, you know, that I read that cite those types of um, stories and some of the ones that I personally follow. Yeah, I, I feel, I feel all that Amazon love. Um, same. I'm 30 miles outside of, the Chicagoland area and using their AI, they're able to tell what I've been searching for and have it at the new distribution center that's literally a half a mile from my home. And if I need that item, it's sometimes dropped off the same day, which is mind blowing. Um, curious to the rest of the group, who's adapting and innovating today um, beyond the folks that, that Phil shared, who are some unique, maybe other, um, groups, organizations that, that you've seen sort of really lean very hard into this and are, are excelling early? Well, if I can jump in, I've got a, a simple one. I, I, I know that we're all thinking about big tech companies and digital companies, but 
To make a point, I want to talk about my friend, Rochelle. And Rochelle is a laundry on entrepreneur here in New York, um, where I live. And she had this idea of disrupting the laundry business. And so, and so uh, my girlfriend and I, we live in an apartment in New York. We, we just, like most people here, we just take our laundry down and drop it to the, the laundry people who are just downstairs in the little laundry shop. And then in the earliest days of the pandemic, um, all the laundry, all the most of the laundry places closed, and we was like, well, what do we do? And and we had the strategic stockpile um, of socks and those underpants that people give you as gag gifts with little messages on them. When you start wearing those, you know it's it, it's red alert. Um, but I knew I called my my friend Rochelle, and I said, uh, and she picked up the phone. I said, Rochelle, I know you're a survivor. I know you figured everything out. Tell me what I need to do. And, and she laughed. She goes, how did you know? And then she, she um, sent me a picture as we were speaking of five cell phones and her business, which had quadrupled in a month. And the, the kind of the core point I'm making is obviously pivoting for all of these companies is the, is the key thing. Um, but the pivot doesn't start at the pivot. It starts by being the type of person, the type of company that can pivot, where that, that whole set of attributes that not just resilience, but foresight, anticipation, flexibility is part of your, your DNA, then you can do it. Because if you're, have, if, you're, if you're trying to create the culture of your organization, at the same time that you have to do something that results from that culture, you're at very least going to be acting uh, suboptimal. Sorry, I've been smiling. Uh, is there, Wendy, did you have something? I do. Um, first of all, yeah, I, I so agree with that. Uh, Rich, you know, hats off to Rochelle. And I'm sitting over here in California going like, there. Are, you could just like drop your laundry off and someone does it? Like, what? How do I get that? But um, so, Literally 40 years ago, um, I worked at NASA uh, Ames Research Center in the Space Biology Research Program, which was a hyper-converged thing all in itself. And uh, they were building the 40 by 80 by 120 wind tunnel at the time. And a guy named Chuck Yeager uh, and I used to go take our lunches um, in the shade of the, of the half-built building. And we would talk about stuff. Um, and I was just stupid and young enough to, and geeky enough to not know who he was. And so it was great because we could have these real conversations and I wasn't terrified and he didn't have to pretend to be anything. Um, and he, one of the things he said was that, um, you know, uh, most uh, records are broken, most profound things are done in really, really small increments. Um, and fast forward to today, there's, a, there's an author named James Clear I like. He, he's written a book called uh, Atomic Habits. Um, and he essentially says like anything that people do, um, we do in small degrees. If we learn a new language, if we uh, learn to walk, you know, it's, it's a step at a time, it's a word or a phrase at a time. Um, and that's the same way that, um, that machines learn, right? Machines are, are trained, you know, one, one uh, smidgen of data at a time um, and societies and groups and all of those things. And so um, I've been thinking about the training data and these atomic, habit changes that are infusing um, our world right now. And I've been trying to understand um, like how I've already changed. Like, you know, am I the crocodile and I've got like, you know, dinosaur DNA, but I think I'm a crocodile, but maybe I'm like a dinosaur. You know, I'm like right in the midst of that. I think, I think you don't feel it while it's happening to you. Unless you're like Rochelle, you know, who's like out there going like, you know, I'm going to be a crocodile, damn it. You know, I'm not going to be a whatever pterodactyl, you know, um, and, and I, I think like how, getting that mindset of saying like, I'm going to be ahead of it, you know, I'm going to eat the mammals, you know, that, that, um, that mindset, I think that's, that's what we're trying to um, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of trying to do that. I'm trying to survive. And, and then I'm trying to figure out like, 
how do I do some of that? How do, how do we move forward in that way? And, and I think um, some of the scientific research um, leads there. The biggest example I've seen is these MR, the, the, the RNA um, vaccines. Like those are a sea change innovation, right? Um, they, they behave differently. You know, the, the, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines behave massively differently than the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And thus they will, um, you know, probably be sufficient um, even as the, the virus changes. Um, that sort of innovation and the acceleration of that, that's what we're living through right now. So like hats off to, you know, behind the scenes, um, there's, a, there's a group of female scientists who worked on this stuff since the 1970s um, and, and made little tiny tweaks and little tiny um, changes so that today it looks like a revolution, but it was, it was tiny. So I, on that note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of open this back up. And Jamie, I'm probably going to come to you here first. But when you think about those overlapping revolutions and change, right, healthcare, agriculture, materials, energy, um, how, how will all of this overlap in, and evolve? You know, Wendy's leading us there. But I'm curious, based on your background and some of the things that pique your interest, how you yeah. think through some of those different areas. Sure. Well, maybe I'll start with uh, with what Wendy was saying about these these amazing, miraculous vaccines. And it's absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the woman who was the prime driver behind the technology that underpins these vaccines had to leave the University of Pennsylvania um, because she couldn't get funding for her work. And they said this is just a dead end. And so she I mean, she'll probably eventually get the Nobel Prize. But so that even in this process of incremental steps, when you're really doing crazy great stuff, um, there's going to be headwinds. And that's the point. But what the mRNA vaccines, why the mRNA vaccines are so significant, and frankly, such a great metaphor, is the thing that we're injecting into our bodies is essentially information. It's code. We're hijacking messenger RNA. It's we're hijacking the messenger and saying, instead of delivering some kind of information payload that you otherwise would have, um, here's some new information. And here's some new information instructing your body to become a manufacturing plant to create something that is not native to your body. It's a the little spike protein that is a replica of what the SARS-CoV-2 virus has. And that, I think, it's like I said, it's a metaphor for this broader issue of the genetics and biotech revolution and our appreciation uh, that biology is code uh, and that our one little species among all these billions that have ever lived, suddenly we have the ability to increasingly and more effectively and efficiently read, write, and hack the code of life. And we're already seeing that major implication for the healthcare world. I know we're short on time, but the summary of that is transitioning from generalized healthcare based on population averages to precision healthcare based on each person's individual biology. But as we try to figure out who everybody is by collecting all of their data and certainly including their sequenced genome, then we realize that humans are a just massive, massive data set. All of life is a massive data set. And while the sophistication, while the complexity of our biology has remained relatively constant for millions of years, the sophistication of our tools is in increasing at an exponential rate. So there will become a time in the not so distant future um, when the complexity of our, uh, of our tools meets and then perhaps exceeds the complexity of our biology. And that's going to move us from our world of precision healthcare to predictive uh, medicine, healthcare, health, and life. That doesn't mean that we are entirely predictable, but we all have a range of possibility. That's why I'm here talking to you and I'm not winning the 100 meters in the Olympics, no matter how much I train. We all exist within a range of possibility. We can push it on, on one end or another. Um, but healthcare, this, the, the, the story of this century, of this century of biology isn't just about healthcare. It's about how unlocking the code of life is going to help us do and think about a lot of things very, very differently uh, from agriculture, uh, where we're going to grow our food, our plants and animals in very, very different ways. And if you, if you aren't 
digging your, your fingers and, and learning about precision fermentation, uh, then everybody should because we're going to be culturing, kind of like brewing with, with beer, but we're going to be brewing a lot of our proteins, a lot of our, of our animal uh, proteins that we eat will be brewed and not, and not grown. Same thing, this shift from extraction to growing is going to fundamentally transform materials, plastics, leathers, all, all sorts of things. Um, it's going to transform the way we think about energy. Again, stepping away from extracting and toward, uh, and toward growing. And for the world that you all are in, um, DNA data storage, we're not there yet, but DNA is a million times more dense than silicon. Um, we already have an alliance between Microsoft and Twist Bioscience and Western Digital and others trying to create a standard for DNA uh, data storage. And when you hear about this uh, mammoth DNA from a million years ago um, that is still readable, I certainly don't know, think anything on my iPhone is going to be readable a million years uh, from now. So it's, again, everything comes back to this very, very rapid and, and accelerating change. And there are so many clues all around us that we can learn from. And I love, Wendy, that you were, uh, had this experience with, with Chuck Yeager because it's such a great thing from being a, a, an ace fighter pilot in, in World War II um, to, and this isn't just from the, the movie, um, but just showing that the, this human element for breaking the sound barrier, it, it, was, it was about technology plus human and, you, you, and, uh, and then taking all of this forward to now where we are really pushing the boundaries of our humanity as our parents understood it. But it's, we're not going to think, wow, this is the future of humanity when we're living it. We're just gonna say, this is how stuff works. I, um, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I'm just thinking about every, every sort of uh, facet that we covered uh, this afternoon and sort of giggling because I, you know, I challenge anyone on this call, anyone attending this call to tell me another call that you've been on or that you think you'll be on where you will hear dinosaurs, infrastructure as code, sequence genomes, um, and, you know, precision fermentation reference in a less than 60 minute period so if you find it email me message me i would uh i would i would really be curious but i want to thank um our panelists our exact mindset contributors today i you know so many things flooding my brain in terms of ways i need to continue to challenge myself and think differently um ways in which i can help my customers and guide them through some of this you know you think phil you might have said this during one hour prep right you know, how are you riding that wave versus standing on the shore and being crushed by it? And how do you get to a point of confidence to make that decision? Um, but thank you to everyone. Thank you to the Nutanix team for bringing us all together and delivering this to um, the audience today. I had a ton of fun. I hope everybody else did too. Um, and I wish you the best for the rest of your, your day and your evening. Thanks all. Thanks, Thanks everybody. That was fun. It was. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, bye. Thanks, everybody. Stay well.